Hello, and welcome to another episode of Better Combo. I'm your host, Nadia Ike. I hope you're all having a lovely Sunday. I'm always excited that I get to spend some time with you guys here today. On today's episode, we have, well, today we have another exciting episode because personally, I have the privilege of being here with a friend of mine and Nigerian triple jump sensation, Olu Olamigo K. And Olu, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to see another familiar face. I'm excited that I get to talk to a fellow triple jumper. I'm excited that I get to talk to someone that I know and really excited for this episode. But before we dive into it, why don't you just give viewers who don't know you a little bit of a background of who you are, your journey, and kind of you know where you are now? All right, hey, um, thanks for an introduction, Nadia. I am Olu Olami Goke Jr. Probably see me as Olu Mide. Um, I am a triple jumper from Nigeria. Um, I have competed for Nigeria. My first time making the team was in 2014, and then um, that was for the Commonwealth Games. And from then on, so about Rio 2016, I competed for Nigeria, still competing for Nigeria, although I've been kind of off the track scene for the past few years, you know, developing some things off the track to set me up outside of my sports career. But um, yeah, so that's me. I mean, in a nutshell, I am a triple jumper, but I'm so much more. I'm really like a human being that also triple jumps rather than a triple jumper that does other things. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad yeah. you said that because that's the reason why we're here. And yeah. it's funny enough because we both actually started competing in 2014. So I think that the first yeah. time we actually met each other was at that Commonwealth Games. I and remember that. Yes, and so going back to 2014 all the way to now, how, looking back on your athletic journey, how do you feel about, you know, your accomplishments? Do you think that you scratched the surface of your talent? Um, I think for a lot of us, we feel like we didn't really get to reach our maximum potential. So I'm curious from your perspective, how do you feel about your career so far? Um, I feel very excited about my career. Um, and I mean that in the most, I mean, in the most genuine way possible. Um, I've always known that for me, I believe I've always been talented in this event from when I first started doing it seriously in 10th grade, I was 2006. Um, and, but even beyond my physical abilities, um, cause I've never been like the strongest guy or the fastest guy out, the biggest guy out there, but I've always been one that if I sit down and learn something on my own pace, when I come back and after I've mastered what I learned, it's game over. And my career has kind of gone into like chapters for that reason. So of course there was a high school chapter where I improved by like over 10 feet and then less than the calendar year. And then from the second chapter, it was kind of like, you know, college to transition to being pro where I improved by about four feet, three years. to so now where again, I am learning and reviewing and studying and who knows how much further I'm going to go. So the best is still far, in front of me, I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, I don't think that my potential is anything that I really, that's really left in any other people's hands. You know, there's a lot of people competing with African countries at times, but I think really that's just kind of like fertilizer for way, in a way that kind of helps me, you know, really blossom. So, yeah. Yeah, and so, and so when you say the future is bright, what are some of the things, like if you look, if you could look at your career in, I guess, the phases, right? What phase do you think you're in right now? Ooh, I love that question. So I'm in the phase where now, let's take a step back. So coming out pro in 2013, after I graduated in 2012, that was really just like my proving, proving myself physically, proving that I could physically run fast enough, be strong enough, and then jump far enough. And as I started trusting my body a lot more, my performances really started to explode very quickly. Um, and then now, ever since Rio, it's interesting how it always goes in four-year chapters for me, but ever since Rio, is more of a mind thing because while physically I already proven myself, physically I've known that I am more than capable of doing anything I want to do on the track. Um, the universe and God just has a way of showing you how to humble yourself by doing all these things that are not even related to track, just life in general that I had to take care of because for the first chapter of my career, I was very focused on track alone and kind of put things to the wayside. Whereas now, you know, I was in my mid twenties after I came back from Rio and I had a lot of real life decisions to make. I had to make a major move from, you know, where I was living to where I am now and changing coaches and then changing careers and all these other things that really tested my mind. So now as I enter like what I see is my third chapter, the masterpiece chapter, I see it's the combination of the two. I've mastered the physical, 
I believe I've mastered, or at least I'm learning how to master in a very real way, the mental. And as I put that together, there's no telling how far I'm going. Okay. And so what is, what would you say the, the hardest part of mastering the mental part? I think that for the physical part, we all go through it. You know, it's like yeah. change coach and, you know, getting used to the workouts and, and trusting your body. Right. But the mental mm -hmm. piece, your mind plays games with you, right? One Man. day you're <laughs> the world, the next day you feel like you're at the bottom and your mind constantly is like one of those things. And it's almost feels like you can't control it. Right. And so sometimes, yeah. sometimes you take 10 steps forward and find yourself five steps behind. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what would you say the most challenging piece of this phase has been or is for you? And how are you combating that? Um, you know, I think part of it is I started working with a sports like sports psychology and performance coach recently, and um, last year actually, almost a year now. But um, that I think was the culmination of learning that yes, I'm able to figure things out on my own. Yes, I love to write. I love. Like write, I've been a writer since I was a kid. I'm always writing and scribbling notes from something. And I always write for myself and I also write for different, you know, to kind of guide other people who follow behind me. So learning that I could write for myself, learning that I could coach myself, learning that through meditation, I can uncover my own, you know, bad habits. That was all great. But it wasn't until I humbled myself to realize I can do all this myself. If I really want to be great, should I? And um, so I think that was like really like the, the spark, really starting to work with a coach who a lot of the times then you realize when you're coaching, working with a coach, you know, a lot of times you're coaching, you know, this as a triple jump, a lot of times you're coaching yourself and your coach is kind of guiding you. So it's the same thing mentally where I find I'm very much aware of a lot of my habits and the ones that I keep running into the walls with, which I have trouble getting past. Um, working with an external coach has been very, very beneficial in terms of like really pushing past those in a very real way in a much faster time. So yeah. I guess to answer the question, I think the number one thing is to humbling myself, knowing I don't have all the answers and even the answers I do have can be applied better with help of someone else. Yeah. And it's so funny that you say that because I think that one of the things that we always forget is that mental training piece, right? Yeah, so when you're physically training, you have a coach, you have a training program, you have all these things in place to get you at your optimal. But then when we talk about mental strength, which is actually the bigger piece than any of this, no yeah. one really has a playbook for how they're doing that. And a lot of people kind of put it on the back burner, like, oh, I need to be mentally tough or I need to be mentally strong, but no one's actually practicing how to do that. And so I'm really glad that you brought that sports psychologist yeah. into it because I think it's such a fundamental piece to, you know, really unlocking the next level of your success. And I think That's it's cool. a lot of times people forget that piece. And because personally, I actually did see a sports psychologist in college. Um, and a little bit after um, college. And I found it very, very crucial to my success, not only in the sport, but beyond that, right? Yeah. And so, and so let's just sh shift gears a little bit, actually, because you were talking about something in terms of coaching yourself. And I really wanted to touch up on that because I think one of the things that I've mentioned in my previous interviews is the fact that in the US, we do lot, we, we lack coaching, right? Especially for triple jump. There are so few coaches that you can work with and, you know, also, when you do work with them, sometimes you're like one in like 20 other people they have to focus on. And so you kind of get thrown to the back burner. I've experienced that personally. Mm -hmm. And so for you, I don't know where you are right now, but do you have a coach at the moment? Oh, yes. Yes. To clarify that part, um, I definitely have a coach. Um, and in fact, I'm, pretty, I'm very lucky to say that my coach that I work with now, I've known since I was 15. So. Okay. Um, and he, so he's kind of seen me up throughout the years. He's been a part of the same coaching network that's helped me get into a lot of success in life outside of track. So when I say coaching myself, it's more so put it this way. When I first started working with him, I was actually doing internships in California while he was based in Virginia. So it was a remote coaching situation. Then I got back to work with him physically and that was great. And then I said life changes. I had to make a major move. So I changed coaches, which coaching setups for that reason, not because of a lack from my former coach, but more so from a change in life. And so I was with another coach temporarily, which was also very helpful to learn some new things. But now I'm back working with my original coach and again, still, still remotely at the moment. But, um, so to say when you're talking about coaching yourself, um, 
even if you have a coach that works with you six days out of the week, seven days out of the week, as an athlete, especially as an Olympic athlete in an event where we're not talking about football or basketball, where we're trying to score more points than someone else, we're trying to do something we've literally never done anytime we step onto the track. We're trying to jump further than we've ever done, objectively. Like, so at a certain point, there's only so much a coach can do. You have to, as an athlete, take that initiative to find your own flaws. It doesn't matter if you're working 12 hours a day with a coach. On that 13th hour, do you have the, the gumption to go figure out your own flaws for yourself and find your own systems to break through them and then bring that back to your coach when you work together? So when I say coaching myself, it's more so like, yeah, I'm, I'm coaching myself through things. And I also collaborate with my other coaches to, so that we can you know, take the insights I find and create systems out of that to my success, which is the number one reason why I even made it to the Olympics and made so much progress in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And it's, it's so, I, I mean, it's funny that you're saying that because, because when we had coach on the show, the year that he actually medaled at the Olympics, he didn't have a coach. He coached oh, really? himself. Yes. <laughs> coach Tomo Kuena. And oh, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not undone, right? It's, it's not yeah. unheard of. And I also think that it even says a lot about athletes to be able to do that, right? To be able to teach yourself something at a super high level and to become top, some of the top, people in the world to do it, right? If you think right. about any career that anyone has, the biggest CMO in the world, they didn't learn how to become a CMO on their mm-hmm. own, right? And But with athletics, it's completely different in a different ball game. And so it's always interesting to collect these stories. Like for me, I learned how to triple jump up with YouTube. I wasn't oh, a same here. <laughs> same here. I wasn't a track athlete. I was a basketball player. And and so it's it's interesting to hear all these different stories and see what athletes are doing, which will lead into our conversation after the break. But before right. we do yeah. do that, I did want to ask you about your injury that you had last year, right? Mm-hmm. So you you had a bit of an injury and you know mm-hmm. I know about it because I know you, but yeah. can you talk yeah. us through that a little bit? And you know, honestly, in terms of looking forward to this phase that you're in, does that, you know, affect your confidence at all? And are you having any doubts at all based off of that injury? I love that question because, um, so the injury itself was, I mean, as an athlete, we get injured, that's part of it. Um, I would even go as far as to say, in the past, I've been hurt rather than injured. I didn't really experience a true injury until this one, where it was a freak accident. It wasn't necessary, it was something that happened in training, um, although I believe that the factors that led to it could have been addressed and I should have spoken up in that situation to do that. Um, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, I'll kind of give you the, the, the bird's eye view of how I look at this whole situation. I got hurt on January 14th of last year, 2020, four days before I was about to open up my season in Clemson. And um, it was... It was a shock, obviously. So, but the injury was I strained, I um, ended up spraining two ligaments in my ankle pretty bad. So I had to go into a boot, a splint, and then a cast. And I've never been in a cast before. So you imagine as being a triple jumper, four days from competing, now you're seeing your foot that's immobilized. This was like, it was a shock. And I remember having so much energy because I was ready to compete. Instead of getting sulk, like, instead of sulking about it, I immediately started making YouTube videos. Because I knew that in a year's time, I'll come back to watch these videos and see how I coached myself through it. And um, so I say that to say I found ways to channel that energy. And by the time I was ready to, you know, come out of the boot and start moving around, then COVID happened. So when I when I got hurt, and this is not in any way to make a false equivalency between my personal injury and the world global pandemic, but there was a lot of similarities in terms of how I was stuck inside the house. I couldn't go anywhere. I had a lot of energy and I was frustrated. And then the world went through the same thing. So I saw that as like, it was really, I always take something I do spiritually. Um, this triple jumping is a spiritual path as well. Um, but that was a very like real world, literally real world um, example that, you know, this track thing isn't everything. And if I take my, you know, my life experiences away from the track and use them to benefit myself on the track, there's no one that can stop me. So now my confidence, you know, it's been at an all time, not, I don't want to say it's at an all time high, it's who I am. I've always mm-hmm. been a confident person, but I've now evolved to the point that where it used to be that doubts would kind of linger more so, you know, and it kind of affect my mood. I'm still human being. Sometimes I get knocked down, but 
I find that the times I get knocked down are fewer and further between. And then when I do, I'm able to get back up much faster, even through the injury in and of itself. So if I didn't go through my past life experiences from 2016 up to 2020 when I got hurt, that injury last year would have forced me to retire because I wouldn't have been mentally ready for it. But I remember being in the house alone because my mom was actually in Nigeria. So my people who live in the house with me were in Nigeria. I'm alone. I'm on the, I'm scooting up the stairs on my butt to go take a bath with a bucket of the water because I have a cast on my leg. I lost like six pounds. And I remember being, I had a moment where I was just wrecked. I was crying. I was like in shambles. And I remember having like, I, I realized like, yo, this is the morning period because I didn't know what was coming next. And I allowed myself to go through that. It was like in a period of nine days. And on that 10th day, it's crazy, it was a Sunday. On that 10th day, I woke up and said, all right, playtime's over. Whatever comes next, I'm taking it. And haven't looked back since. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know what's quite interesting about that whole story is the fact that, and I think it's really why we have this show, right? Sports yeah. is a microcosm for life, right? And I yeah. think a lot of times, athletes and people in general separate the two worlds completely, right? Where they exactly. think that your experiences as, your, as an athlete are separate from your ex personal experiences. You just go on the track, you do what you need to do, and then you live as, as a person. But I think the more that people are able to live those two lives together at the same time simultaneously and really allow the experience to kind of merge into each other, the better it is. And I think it also makes it easier to transfer the skill sets into each other because everything that you experience in that time that you went through your injury is anything that someone could experience in you know in their business right in their mm -hmm. personal life in anything right and being able to overcome that and move on is what's necessary to succeed beyond the track right and right. so we're just going to take a quick break, right? But before we, but, but when we come back, we will talk a little bit more about how you've been able to translate this, you know, resilience that you have in the sport into your personal life. So we'll take a quick break and when we get back, we'll dive into that. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, I'm gonna leave. Welcome back to Better Combo. If you are just joining us today, we are here with Olu Olamigoke, who is a Nigerian triple jumper. And prior to the break, we were talking about his experiences as an athlete and overcoming injury. And so as we're diving into the second part of the show, we're going to talk to Olu about how he's been able to overcome those challenges and really transition that into his professional career. Olu, are you still there? Absolutely. Yes. So before the break, we kind of touched up a little bit on your, about your injury and how that kind of set you off into this new mental space where you're kind of ready to attack this year. And before we dive into your professional endeavors that you're doing beyond the sport, can you just share a little bit about the goals that you actually have for this year? And so luckily for you, you got to have the pandemic as a, <laughs> as a little yeah. bit of a you didn't have that pressure to compete in 2020. But yeah. as you're looking ahead into this year, what are some of the goals that you have? Man, the goal is still Tokyo 2020 um, <clears throat> or 2021. Um, but I would even say it's more, 
bigger than bigger than Tokyo um, is really to recover. I have a two pronged goal to recover and surpass. So recover fully from the injury, you know, um, make sure that as I come back, I'm not I'm not rushing because even in the last fall, you know, when I started training again, I kind of found myself going too fast too soon and having to stop. And I didn't re-injure anything, thank God, but I did find I wasn't able to find consistency. So now my goal is to recover consistently so I can train consistently. Because as you know, you have to be consistent to making progress, real progress. And then from once I do that, once I'm fully recovered, to surpass wherever I was even at any point in my career before then. I'm talking 200% better than anything I ever was before. This left ankle that was once my quote-unquote weak point in my, in my uh, physical, in my body, before the injury is now about to be my strong point. So, but that all comes with recovering fully first. And along that path, of course, training and doing my best to get back on the track and compete for Tokyo. Um, but I'm not so limited in my perspective. I think before the injury, I was like, Tokyo or nothing. Where now it's like, put it this way. I talk about this quote all the time. I first went to the um, national, Museum, National Museum of Af African American History and Culture, mouthful of the word, but back in DC, after I came back from Rio, and I, that was the first time I saw that there was this quote from Jesse Owen on the wall, and it said, the road to the Olympics leads, and I'm paraphrasing, the road to the Olympics leads in the end to the best, no, to no city, no country, but in the end to the best that's within us. And so as I was going for Tokyo, and I was trying to go Tokyo, 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 like I was really tense, and I got hurt, and I couldn't go like that anymore. I was like, okay, hold up. Let's go back to that. It kind of kept clicking my mind. It was almost like Jesse Owens was whispering in my ear. It's not just about Tokyo. It's not just about the game. It's about overcoming, surpassing anything you ever want, thought you were capable of. So that's my goal. Um, Tokyo and everything else along the path just falls into that goal, recover and surpass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I mean, that's a very powerful statement, right? And I think that yeah. that message gets lost a lot because mm. as athletes, we're so focused on the end result that no one's thinking about what the end result actually is at all right, right? And for many people it's like well, i want to go to the olympics or i want to win a medal i want to do this i want to do that and then that you do that and then what right yeah. Yeah. And, and i think and i think for me what has really changed the way at my relationship to the sport is really looking at everything as so what you yeah. won the <laughs> one so what yeah. what's so what right and and if, and if there isn't an answer to that then that's the problem, right? And mm -hmm. so really figuring out what your so what is. You win, you go to the Olympics, you do the best performance, so what? And so, mm -hmm. so what to you? What is that for you? So for me, it's always been, well, not always been, especially then since coming back from Rio, I'm trying to tell you, when you go, I'm fortunate to say I've had the experience of becoming an Olympian and competing in the Olympic Games. Um, so going to your point about being an athlete, we focus so hard on the outcome. As I mentioned earlier, it was all about, Rio was all about the outcome for me. It was just, I had to make it to Rio and I did it. But what I didn't do was I didn't, even though I've always considered myself a human being that's also an athlete, I got so sucked up in the Rio dream that I forgot to plan after Rio. So I had the honeymoon phase, which lasted probably about a month. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> and I also lost my job because I was coaching at a, univer a division one university. So it wasn't like I was doing some, you know, some high school coaching. I was doing some top level the NCAA division one coaching and to lose my job and not have the plan. I was like, whoa. Um, and losing the job came as a part of, you know, deciding to go with my career. So I have no hard feelings towards it, even though I did at the time. Um, I say all that to say this. Um, my so what is continuing I, on the surface level, I like to, my, I've always been someone to give back. It's even though I can be kind of stingy with like when it comes to the physical things, <laughs> um, you ask my family or people close to me, but like when it comes to the game, like the, the psychological game, I'm always talking, I'm always giving that game to people. That's my, that's my entire mission. Um, so it went from being very surface level. How do I give that? I want to keep giving back the game. And now I'm making practical systems to do that from, you know, hosting conversations. And now, um, and one thing I was very, I wrote down in my, like, I'm always, as I said, I'm always writing something. And I noticed that what I write tends to pat, come to pass almost always. If I want it to happen, it will happen. One thing I wrote is that back in 2016 is I want to mentor athletes. 
And I find myself now having weekly conversations with athletes. People, kids are hitting, kids, athletes are hitting me up, you know, social media, and we're having FaceTime calls, we're having phone calls, and I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do. So the so what is giving back that game of, you know, how I made it to become who I am, not just the Olympian, but the human being that I am, because it's the human being that I am that created the Olympian that I am, if that makes sense. And yeah. um, so continuing to follow that purpose and walk in that purpose in a very real way, that's the so what. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's, that's very powerful and that's very important because I think that one of the pieces of this issue is that, you know, there's this misconception for a lot of young athletes that I go to the Olympics and then I get a lot of money or I go to the Olympics and all these contracts are going to come to me, (laughs) you know, and that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And and no one's sharing that information as well. Right. And so it's so crucial that, you know, people like you, people like me, this platform is really creating that space for that conversation to be had. Right. Right. Even when you are making money, what is the stats? Like 70 percent of NFL and NBA players go broke within five years of retirement and they make multi-million dollar contracts. So even with the money, there has to be more. There has to be more. This is not the end. The end goal is in the sport, right? It's part of the journey. And figuring out which part of that that falls into the journey. But anyway, moving on from that. So Mm -hmm. I know you're working on various things outside of the sport as you're continuing to build your brand. And so do you mind telling us a little bit about what some of those things are and what some of the challenges that come with doing that while you're also trying to be this amazing phenomenal athlete um you know i guess one thing is realizing i don't have to try to be the phenomenal athlete i just am so anything that i do beyond that is it's kind of just you know michael jordan just goes up to the gym and he's, he may put up 10 bricks but if someone sees him make that one shot they're like oh my god jordan just did the one shot that's amazing so i kind of see i'm walking in that type of air now um so along those lines um i am really pursuing my creative passions my hobby, I've always been super creative since I was a kid, but I never really dove into my creative pursuits until I was in my late 20s. And um, I actually just finally bought my own digital, digital camera after. Uh, like, I took a physical, um, um, a photography class in high school. I was on the yearbook class. and year, I made the year part of the yearbook team. But I didn't buy my own camera until last year. And when I bought that, it just took off because I'd been developing my photog- photographic eye for over a decade. So when I got the camera, it was just a matter of extension. Um, so I'm really going into that and that's actually bringing in some income that I'm not really, you know, I wasn't really planning on making a business out of it, but it's kind of making itself. So I'm just surrendering to that. Um, personal training and really more so than personal training, just fitness coaching, um, as well as what I went to school for or part of what I went to school for. Um, I also have, as I said, as far as the mentoring goes, I'm mentoring and I have a group called No Donuts Tokyo. Um, it's on social media, it's on Instagram, you can see it. Um, but that's like a private group of like-minded athletes like Uh athletes who are younger than me who are generally like you know upperclassmen in high school or in college or even fresh out of college who are you know trying to walk the path of being a great athlete but and I don't know if they realize it I mean most of them realize I'm sure but they may not say it that even as they walk these select people who are in this group, they're walking the path of becoming a better athlete, but they're also walking the path of becoming a better person. And that's why we all connect. So when I talk about giving back the game, I'm constantly sending them emails, having conversations with them. And there's no money being exchanged, but I feel richer than I've ever felt doing this. So yeah, man, that's that. And then there's also, like I said, there's some, there's some actual physical things that I'm creating right now that I've talked about for some time, but I think right now I'm kind of in the incubating period that the next time the world hears about it, it's re- it'll be ready and it's going to be, you know, so I'm not going to be on a cliffhanger, but stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. And we're, you know, we're here for you. We're excited for yeah. you and we're here to support you in any way that we can, but we're, we're almost getting to our time now, but before we do, I do have one more question. What do you think needs to happen in the sports industry? to really get athletes, not just track athletes, just athletes in general, to really see themselves holistically as a person that's living life, not just an athlete doing X, Y, Z, and then a person. Because I think part of the the struggle is, we mentioned this earlier, is really being done with the sport and then realizing that there's nothing else to you, right? Right. And so what needs to happen, 
I guess societally, I like, I don't even know if it has to be a society thing, but what does, what needs to happen, at least within the sports industry, do you think that can help athletes begin to merge those two worlds together? Um, you know, I think that's a very deep question. <laughs> so, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna do my best to answer it, but um, that's something I'd like to reflect on. But I think at the, on the surface level, the first thing that's coming to my mind, it's gotta be a two-pronged approach. I think the institution of sport and by institution of sport, whatever leagues or IAAF or NCAA or even NBA, NFL or Pop Warner football for that, for that matter, the institutions themselves have to do a better job of getting people to realize that their success as an athlete, I don't want to say it should come secondary to sex, being successful as a human, but they should look at it holistically. Like, like how do we bring it together? How do we merge it? Um, and then from the other side of it, I think, because, you know, what you see on social media, let's be real, social media is everybody's on social media. Even if you're not on social media, you're influenced by social media. And that's the thing. So back in the day where there used to be a little bit more space and more quiet for an athlete to really get to know themselves as a person, say the days of Muhammad Ali or Ayrton Senna, one of my heroes as well, um, there's not that anymore. Because now all these athletes are saying the likes and the posts and the posts and the, this guy did this really good jump and this was on the, this is going viral. And so it's very easy to get sucked up into that. So I think institutionally we need to start at that level or they need to start at that level. We, I guess, because we're really part of that institution. And then on the other hand, I think the athletes themselves need to not be afraid of opening up. Now, by the athletes, you know, you have LeBron who starts his own, he had the shop that show on HBO, you have other athletes who are doing that. But I think other athletes like ourselves who may not have the worldwide fame, I mean, we, we kind of have more wide recognition, but maybe not the simple worldwide celebrity. We got to do our part in terms of helping athletes develop real skills. Like, I mean, I teach the mentor group I'm telling you, I teach them what I know about finances. I teach them about everything I know. So it has to be grassroots, but it also has to be at the top. And if we attack it from both sides, we can bring it down, down to the middle and find a balance. Yeah. And I think I think actually one of the biggest things that you touched upon is social media. Um, I think the thing the the problem with social media is that <laughs> the power of reach, everyone has the power to reach anyone, even if they shouldn't. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's the problem. So you have everyone putting stuff out there and everyone being able to be in multiple places simultaneously that they have no business being. And so you're seeing, you're trying to focus on who you are trying to become. And then you're seeing all these other things and all these other avenues telling you what you should be or how life should be or how this should be. And so even trying to form that identity um, is one issue. And then there's this whole glamor, at least with track and field about being a track athlete that we all know from the inside is not true. Mm -hmm. so inspiring to be part of this, Thing that's just all smoke. It's nothing. There's some good parts to it. Don't get me wrong, but it's like at the same time, it's not like you're gonna be. Look, I competed in six countries in two months in 2014. I negotiated my way into five of those countries. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not had the hard skills of communicating, knowing how to send an email, knowing how to send a proposition, a proposal. Like these are the skills that you know. Put it, I'm putting this out into the universe now. One of the things I would like to do is like teach a college course specifically for student athletes who want mm -hmm. to operate and still still take their foot professionally, but also learn how to be a professional in other capacities. Yeah. Because when we learn how to send the proposal, when we know how to speak for ourselves, when we know how to do all these things, all of a sudden we don't need an agent now. An agent is great yeah. because they'll put the load off of you, but until you know how to be an agent for yourself, you're signing off your own personal power to someone else and do it for you. And I think that you can really be taught in an institutional level. And that's how we can start to make the change we need to see. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll close with this. Look, one of the things that I've been saying to a couple of people lately is that when you are an athlete, at least once you get past the college level, you have to realize that this is a business. You are a walking business. Yes. And you have, to, you have to operate like that. You have to look at where your profits are. You have to look at where your losses are and you have to cut. You have to, you have to operate in that mindset, but a lot of people don't see it that way. And so you have people who invest time, money and years into something that a business that's not profiting and right. that's a problem, you know, and that's, right. I mean, 
I, I, I kind of brought this up with Kotsil when he was on this uh, on, on the show, but this is a whole separate conversation and we need way more time, <laughs> way more yeah. time to discuss that. But I think that's the problem. And once people are able to learn that this is actually a business, this is transactional. Your time yeah. on the track should be transactional. It doesn't have to necessarily be transactional for money because there really isn't that money, much money in the sport. But it has to be transactional for something. So whether you're meeting a connection that's going to help you, whether you're connecting with people, whether you're building ideas with people on the track, whether you're doing something, it has to translate into something that's going to profit your business in yeah. the long run, right? And I yeah. think that's where the, the mismatch is. But beyond that, I always close the show with this, though. Mm -hmm. Is there one thing that the world doesn't know about you? I know you shared your art thing, but is there one thing that the world doesn't know about you that they should? Whether it's a secret talent that you have or there's just something that no one would ever, it's unsuspected, no one would ever think that about you. Hmm. Dang, I wish I had more time to think about that one. Uh... Jeez, there's so much about me that... It could, be, it could be witty, it could be, it could be anything. It's just okay. anything. <laughs> um... Let me just think about the first thing that comes into my mind. I'm just looking around at my my room, my apartment, or the living room right now. Okay, uh, I <laughs> love cars. I, I, people know that about me, right there. That's pretty boring. You love um, cars. I love that's that's lame though. Um, I could say that I am a writer at mm -hmm. heart. I said that earlier too, but I don't think people really realize that. I mean, in the truest sense. And I think uh, going back to the whole social media analogy, just because, you know, maybe this is going to inspire somebody else, but just because you don't share your writing doesn't make, make you any less of a writer. Wow. I've been honing, honing this craft for some years now. So when things come out, you know, <laughs> matter of fact, I'm a published author. Nobody knows that. <laughs> you're what? <laughs> I'm a published author. <laughs> you're like, a published yeah, yeah. author. <laughs> uh, my own. I was in. Um, I'm in a collection of story, short stories that I wrote with a writing group in DC that we, we self-published. Okay. Here's the book right here. <laughs> okay. Here, sharing memories, sharing lives, and look at your boy right here on the back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Love yeah. to see it. Well, <laughs> honestly, Olu, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so yeah. so so much for for being here with us. I think that we touched up on so many things and so many conversations that could break off into their own things. And I'm sure we will have yeah. you back to have some of these deeper conversations. And thank you to everyone for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the conversation, please feel free to continue in the chat below. Catch us here next week for another episode that you wouldn't want to miss. So till then, 